Right, we are recording. Um, first thing I'm going to do is review, or I don't know if we got to this last time. I'm going to draw a quick picture of the banding pattern, the repeating banding pattern of the myo in the myofilaments of uh, myosin, actin, and, and describe what a sarcomere is. So call it my red pen here. Quickly, I'm going to draw a center line like this. And then the myosin, the thick filament molecules, the myofilaments sort of look like this. And I'm going to draw three of them. This is just the arrangement of myofilaments within <clears throat> the myofibril inside of one cell, one fiber cell. So these horizontal red bands are the actual myosin molecules, the thick filaments that I'm emboldening here with red. This center vertical line is called the M line, just stands for middle line. And then there's a structural protein called the Z disc. And you can see why it's called the Z disc because it has that zigzag pattern. Those are what anchor the actin molecules, which I'm just going to put in yellow. There's actin, actin, actin. So these Z discs are structural proteins that anchor those actin molecules. And then, so we have actin in yellow, myosin in red. There is a third contractile protein called titan. I'll just put that in blue so you can see it. That helps anchor the end of the myosin filaments to that Z disc as well. And it's usually drawn as like a coiled spring. This is full of elastic fibers. So this, I'll label it, this titan molecule, T-I-T-I-N. T-I-T-I-N. That enables the muscle to recoil when it's stretched as well as after it contracts um, to its original shape. So we've got myosin here. Let me use red. Thick filament. We've got actin in yellow as the thin filament. We've got a Z disc here. And it all keeps repeating both left and right. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So off of the Z disc, we then we get a whole new string of actin molecules going this way and actin molecules going this way to the left and right. And then we'd also repeat the myosin molecules like this. And they would be attached to a new M line out here. And it would just keep repeating itself in both directions. The reason I'm drawing this repeating pattern is because it is the overlap in the overlapped regions of this repeating pattern, that that's what gives the muscle cells their striations or their stripes. So when we look at a muscle cell on a microscope with a just a decent lab microscope, the muscle cells look like they have these vertical stripes and they kind of look like this. And they have a darker banding pattern, sort of like this, very regular, they're called striations, batting, banding pattern. What we're actually seeing in those stripes is where these uh, filaments overlap each other. Like right here, there's an overlap which produces a darker banding pattern. Now, the last thing before I get, get off this page is from this Z disc over to the other Z disc right here, we call that one sarcomere. And what a sarcomere refers to one contractile unit of skeletal muscle tissue. So this 
banding pattern keeps repeating itself thousands, hundreds of thousands of times throughout a muscle and thousands of times throughout a muscle cell. And when the myosin molecule reaches up, grabs actin like this, and then pulls it toward the M line, that's called the power stroke of contraction. And you can imagine if this sarcomere shortens because the actin gets pulled this way and this way, and then that happens again at this sarcomere, and then again at this sarcomere, the, whole, the entire muscle get, gets shorter. So this muscle, if it was contracting, would bulge and get, but get shorter in length like this because of that pulling toward the M line thousands of times over. All right, so we've done all the muscle contraction business, um, meaning from the motor neuron all the way through calcium being released from the terminal cisternae of sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you're a bit lost on what I'm saying, that's all in the, the prior video that I recorded. Now we're gonna get on to um, more topics regarding muscular contractions. And the first one, I'm just gonna write duration of contraction. What dictates how long a muscle contract is basically the presence of three ingredients. These three ingredients, I'm gonna write them one, two, three, determine if a muscle can contract the presence of them. And then the amount dictates the duration that that contraction can last. And so number one is just stimulus from the motor neuron, the nerve cell. So we need that for a muscle cell to contract and how much or how long of a stimulus we get dictates how long that contraction will last as well. Second ingredient is the presence of free calcium in the cytoplasm. So we need calcium, you know that now. We need calcium to uncover those active binding sites on actin. So the presence of calcium in the cytoplasm dictates first that a, a contraction can exist and secondly, how long it will exist depending on how much calcium is available. And last but not least, availability of ATP. So we need ATP to power the myosin head, enable it to pull actin toward the M line, the power stroke, and how much ATP is available will also dictate the duration of contraction as well. I want to go over these terms really quickly. These are two different types of contraction, isotonic versus isometric contractions. Isotonic, just think that the muscle either shortens or lengthens during contraction. So the muscle changes its length. So change in length, muscle length during contraction. And also during contraction, tension is produced or force that a muscle can act on a load. Isometric contractions is there's still tension. I'm gonna write tension and force created just like in an isotonic contraction I'm gonna write, I didn't write tension and force. In this one, in isometric, tension and force is created, but there is no change in muscle length or size. So I'll, I'll quickly describe the specifics of this. Isotonic, we know that there's change in muscle shape or size or length during contraction and force is created, there's two types of isotonic contractions. There's something called a concentric isotonic contraction in which the muscle length shortens. The muscle shortens and force is produced, tension and force are produced. 
The second type of isotonic contraction is called eccentric. And in this case, the muscle lengthens and tension and force are created. So picture this, um, you, you lift a weight with your forearm, you have it in your hand and you lift it, uh, you contract your biceps brachii muscle. During, that would be called the concentric isotonic contraction. Let me do this. I'm gonna lose my whiteboard if I, if I show you, uh, give you a demonstration. So um, if, if this is my arm, and I have a weight in it, there's my elbow, and I, I'm holding a weight with my hand like this, and I bend my arm at the elbow, the biceps brachii muscle shortens, it contracts and shortens, that would be a concentric <clears throat> isotonic contraction. Now, if my arm is already bent, and it's holding the same weight like this, and I move my arm this way, I extend it. This muscle, my biceps brachii lengthens, but there's still force or tension created in that example. That would be an isotonic eccentric contraction. Isometric, the tension force created, there's no change in muscle length. Um, this one, force is still produced in the muscle without a change in the muscle size or length. Picture this, if you try to lift a load or lift an object that's too heavy for you to actually lift, there's no change in muscle uh, length or shape really going on, but force is still created. I always give the example when I'm in person, um, I push on the wall of the classroom and I say, if I were trying to push over this wall or move this wall, obviously I don't have the strength to do that. My muscles can't produce that amount of tension and force, but I'm still creating tension in my muscles. It's like if you try to lift up an automobile, um, your muscles still create force and tension, but there's no change in length. That would be isometric. <clears throat> Next term we need to discuss is this myoblast. Myo means muscle, blast means immature cell. So I'm just gonna define this for you. A myoblast is an immature skeletal muscle cell. It has one nucleus And how an adult muscle fiber forms is by the fusion of many immature myoblasts. So I'm just gonna write many fuse together to form a multinucleate. This is how muscle fibers, mature muscle fibers acquire more than one nucleus to form multinucleate mature fibers. So mature muscle fiber cells get many nuclei because of the fusion of many myoblasts. Now, not all myoblasts, not all immature muscle cells fuse to form mature muscle fibers. Those that don't fuse they become myosatellite cells. Myosatellite cells then act in the aid of, of muscle tissue repair. When muscle fibers get damaged from trauma or injury, myosatellite cells, which were derived from myoblasts, they aid in repair, I'm just gonna put of damaged skeletal muscle tissue. Now, if you remember from our tissues discussion a long time ago, skeletal muscle tissue is not super repairable, even though, and it's kind of a contradiction, even though it has high vascularization as well as innervation, 
it's on the lower end of, of repairability in terms of, of other tissues. Okay, next big topic now is referred to as muscle metabolism. When you see this term, just think, how does a muscle cell, a muscle fiber generate ATP? We know that a muscle cell needs ATP in order to contract, in order to give that myosin head its energy. How does a muscle cell actually obtain its ATP to perform that? That's what this topic is about. <clears throat> so a muscle, a, a skeletal muscle cell uses ATP in four ways. It acquires and uses ATP and four methods in this specific order. First, always a muscle cell uses stored ATP. So when a muscle first begins to contract, it uses any ATP that is stored in the muscle fiber cell. This is good for about four to six seconds worth of contraction. So just at the initial stages of contraction, the muscle uses whatever ATP it has stored inside of the cell. Then it quickly runs out of that. It goes to a process called direct phosphorylation to produce Oh, roughly up to about 15 seconds worth of contraction. Then I'll explain two, three, and four in detail on the next page. Then a muscle cell, I want you to get the sequence down first, which is why I'm writing all four. Then a muscle cell goes to something called anaerobic glycolysis. And it's complicated, but I'll simplify it for you to produce, oh, roughly, I, it's, this varies from muscle to muscle, individual to individual, but about 45 seconds worth of contraction. Some books say longer. And finally, if we wanna sustain muscle contraction for longer than 45 seconds to a minute, then we need, the muscle cell needs a process called aerobic, respiration to produce its ATP. And this can last for hours. So step one is how a muscle uses and generates ATP is in this order. One, two, three, four. I'm not going to say anything more about stored ATP because all muscles, all skeletal muscles do store some amount of ATP. Not a whole lot, but it's there to help the muscle cell begin its stage of, con of contraction. Now I'm going to talk a lot more about two, three, and four and what these processes are. So I'm going to put a number two here, just so you remember that it's the second place a muscle goes to harvest its ATP, and that's a process called direct phosphorylation. And just like the name says, what we do is we take, if, if an ATP molecule is used, so there's a stored ATP molecule, let's say we use it up. What that means when we say we've used that ATP is we've broken off the, there's three phosphates on this molecule. We've broken off the last one. And so when it's used, what we have left over is ADP plus that broken off phosphate. This stands for adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates. This stands for adenosine diphosphate. So there's still two attached and there's one lone phosphate out here. Now it would be really easy if we could just glue this phosphate molecule back on here, but we can't do that. Um, so what we need to do is ultimately convert this molecule back into ATP and there is a molecule called creatine phosphate that enables that in our muscles. 
So what we do to turn ADP back into ATP is we borrow the phosphate and creatine phosphate and add it to the ADP to create ATP again. And there's an enzyme that speeds up this reaction, this donation and this reaction. And that enzyme is called creatine kinase with a K. This is an enzyme that speeds up the reaction of direct phosphorylation. It's called direct phosphorylation because Ultimately, yeah, we are. We're just taking this phosphate and sticking it back on this molecule to ultimately form another ATP. So that's the first way that, that a muscle cell can generate more ATP after it's used up as its number one, it's stored ATP. I'm gonna to go to another board here and talk about number three, which is anaerobic glycolysis. Let's just dissect this, this term for a minute. <clears throat> Anaerobic means no oxygen, without oxygen. Glycolysis, if we split that word into two, it's glyco, which means sugar, and lysis, which means to break apart. So what we're gonna do is break apart a sugar molecule in the absence of oxygen to create more ATP. Now I'm gonna to describe to you how our cells do that. So I'm not gonna draw a long cylindrical muscle cell. I'm just gonna draw a circular cell, the same space. <clears throat> and I'm gonna draw, just for fun, I'm gonna draw a blood vessel out here. Let's just say we have glucose. We've eaten some pasta or a candy bar and we have glucose in our bloodstream. That is a readily available energy source. When that glucose enters the cell, in this case, a muscle cell, muscle fiber, it starts to get broken down. It breaks, it breaks in half, actually. It's, it's glucose is a six carbon molecule that gets split into two, three carbon molecules. And those, when it breaks, the product of that is called pyruvate, pyruvate is a three carbon molecule that's a product from splitting this in two. We also get a byproduct called lactic acid. Now the pyruvate, when this glucose molecule gets broken into two pyruvates, that gives off, that gives us a two ATP also as a product. So we get a small amount of ATP when we split glucose into two pyruvates. Notice that we have no oxygen present to do this. Galactic acid, which I'm gonna say a few things about that right now so that I don't have to come back to it. So when, we, when our muscles contract in the absence of oxygen and they use an energy source like glucose, they produce a small amount of ATP and they produce this lactic acid as a byproduct. That's the burn that you feel in your muscles when you're exercising vig vigorously, especially in strength training. So for example, um, if you do, if I asked you to do 30 squats really fast, you'd start to feel a burn in your thighs and your quadriceps muscles. That burning sensation comes from the buildup of lactic acid, which is a byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis. One, this byproduct quickly enters the bloodstream, goes to the liver and gets broken down and gets converted back into glycogen for storage. But this originally creates that burn. And you know that if you stop exercising, a few seconds later, that burn starts to go away because this lactic acid enters the bloodstream and goes to the liver to be broken down. But in essence, I've drawn for you the anaerobic glycolysis process. It's using an energy molecule like glucose, splitting it in half to get two pyruvates. In that process, that yields two ATP molecules that now the muscle cell can use as energy and a byproduct called lactic acid. Now let's go to number four, 
<clears throat> and number four process of a muscle cell to produce ATP is called aerobic respiration. That's sort of a redundant statement. Aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. Respiration is a process that uses oxygen. <clears throat> I'm gonna draw the same cell. I'm gonna make it a little bigger. I run out of space down there. So here's a cell. And if we go through that same process, there's our energy molecule. It doesn't have to be glucose. It's just glucose is almost always used first because it's more easily broken down. Um, if there's no glucose available, the body can also use proteins, fats, triglycerides to, as an energy source, but it's just, it's a longer process and also to harvest those. So nevertheless, we know what happens here. In the absence of oxygen, glucose gets split into two pyruvate molecules, which produces two ATP. Now, let's say that we need more ATP than this process up here can provide. What we do is we start breathing heavily and taking oxygen. I'm gonna draw an oxygen molecule into our blood. That oxygen molecule then, or molecules, can also enter our muscle cells specifically then go to an organelle called the mitochondria. Remember the mitochondria is the site of ATP synthesis, the major site of ATP synthesis. In the presence of oxygen, this pyruvate molecule also enters the mitochondria. So oxygen and pyruvate enter the mitochondria, combine with each other, and guess what? They produce about 30 ATP molecules. So this, I'm gonna put a big star around it, is much more efficient. The reason we say it's more efficient is because now from one glucose molecule, rather than getting only two ATP in the absence of oxygen, we get that plus 30 more. So we ultimately get about 32 ATP in the presence of oxygen, just from one glucose. This takes time, it's a slower process, but it's much more efficient. We produce a ton of ATP with it. So now I'm gonna go back really briefly to my previous page, or two previous pages, back to this list here. So let's just say you're going for a run and you wanna start out really fast. The first few steps you take uses St what stored ATP you have in your muscles. But very quickly that runs dry and then your cells go to direct phosphorylation as a process. That gets you about 15, maybe 20 seconds down the road. And then your cells start to use this process, anaerobic glycolysis, in which we need an energy source like glucose in the absence of oxygen, it produces a minimal amount of extra ATP. That would get us about 45 to 60 seconds down the road. We're still running. Now, let's just say we, we could hold our breath for steps one, two, and three. We don't really need oxygen. You can hold your breath for about 45 seconds, but especially when you're performing an activity like running, then you have to start gasping for air. And that is the final step here of aerobic respiration that also uses glucose, but also oxygen gets used here. And when we combine those two processes, we produce a ton of ATP, 32 per glucose molecule. And that gives us hours worth of muscle activity. By and large, over 90% of our muscle activities use this process we just don't realize it day to day. It's, we're, we're continuously breathing in and out, in and out. Much of that oxygen that we're breathing all the time every day is used for muscular activity. Unless we are sleeping, of course, then it's used, it's used for other things as well. All right, so that gets off that long complicated process of muscle metabolism. So we have finished with aerobic respiration. Now let's call up a new whiteboard. 
and I'm going to briefly talk about the force of contractions. We know that our muscles can vary the force of tension that's produced through a contraction. And the, the example I almost always give is in class, I either pick up a pencil or a piece of paper and I say, this doesn't, this doesn't require a lot of muscle force to do this. But then if I pick up a 20 pound chair or a trash can, that, that requires a lot of muscle force to do that. This is how muscle force varies in, in contraction requirement. So force of contractions is really affected by these four factors. First, the number of fibers that are stimulated within the muscle. Number of fibers stimulated. If we stimulate a few fibers in the muscle, not much force is produced. If we stimulate most or all of the fibers in a typical skeletal muscle, it produces a lot more force. Secondly, the size of the fibers that are stimulated, small, delicate fibers are more sensitive to neural stimulation. They typically get stimulated first and then big forceful fibers, large in diameter, they are less sensitive to neural stimulation and they get recruited for contraction only if needed. So uh, another example I commonly give is if you go over to a cardboard box and attempt to pick it up and you don't know what's inside of it, the, the, the fibers that get stimulated first are the small delicate fibers. Then if, you, if your nervous system realizes the box is full of heavy contents, it is the larger fibers that get stimulated last. Three is frequency of stimulation. So our nervous system fires neural impulses, releases that acetylcholine onto a, our, our muscle fibers at the motor end plate. If we increase the frequency of nerve firing on a particular muscle fiber and therefore muscle fibers in general, if we increase the frequency, that increases the force of contraction. <clears throat> and finally, the last thing that <clears throat> is that affects the force of contraction is the size of the muscle. And in parentheses, I'm gonna put in length prior to contraction. There is an optimal length that will produce the most force in a muscle. If a muscle is too stretched, it won't produce as much force as if it's at, at its ideal length. If the muscle is too compressed or contracted, it also can't produce as much force as the ideal length. So that brings us to, leads us into what is a graded muscle response. In my example of picking up a pencil as opposed to picking up, say, a table or something very heavy. <clears throat> These factors that I'm going to list are how a muscle varies its response and varies is another term for graded. So how a muscle grades its response or varies its contraction force is based on these things. <clears throat> First, it can vary its muscle response based on the change in stimulus frequency. So that's this one. If we fire a nerve onto a muscle faster and faster and faster, it produces a greater amount of tension. The tension becomes additive. If I fire, I'm gonna draw a little graph here up in the upper right hand corner. If I stimulate a muscle fiber and then rest and then with a nerve cell and then stimulate it again and then rest, 
the muscle fully relaxes. But if I stimulate that muscle fiber, and then before it has a chance to fully relax, I stimulate it again, the, contract, the force gets greater and greater and greater, the faster I stimulate the muscle fibers. So eventually, it, it looks like this. You don't even see that blip of relaxation. That is the change in stimulus frequency. And we call this graph that I've drawn here, temporal summation, because over time we're increasing the stimulus frequency. So that's one way we can vary the strength of contraction is by changing how fast we stimulate it with the neuron. The second way is by stimulating more or less muscle fibers within the muscle. And that's called multiple motor unit summation. So let's just say we want to increase the muscle contraction rather that we can do it one way by increasing the frequency of the firing from the nerve, which was number one. We can also recruit more fibers within the muscle. So just like I said up here, the number of fibers stimulated within a muscle <clears throat> will also change the force of contraction. And just to remind you, small, I'm going to say weak fibers are more sensitive to neural stimulation, are stimulated first. Then if needed, if necessary, large, strong fibers, which are less sensitive to neural stimulation, I'm going to say are stimulated later if needed. So those are the two ways we can basically vary or create a graded muscle response. Two terms we need to define. Hypertrophy, which literally means the enlargement of a skeletal muscle in size, in physical size. And this is almost always due to activity or resistance put on that muscle. Think strength training. Um, we all know that if we work out with weights, AKA resistance training, our muscles get larger in mass. This is not due to the number of fibers increasing in the muscle. We don't grow new muscle cells. We don't change the number of fibers in a particular muscle. Those individual fibers, they get bigger. And this is why <clears throat> inside of each individual fiber, we do increase the number of myofibrils, which to remind you, those are specialized organelles within each fiber that contain myofilament. We also increase the number of individual myofilaments, myosin and actin. Other things increase in number as well. Typically mitochondria, So we don't increase the number of actual cells or fibers. Those fibers just get bigger, larger. Likewise, if we stop with our training exercises or our activity, they get smaller as well, which brings me to the next term, atrophy, which means the decrease in muscle mass or size. due to inactivity. So when a muscle is left inactive, the individual fibers decrease in size 
And in extreme cases, if somebody's bedridden for a long time with disease or whatever, that muscle tissue can actually start to break down and that's irreversible in the human body. Right, um, I jotted down a list of things I wanted to cover in my notes. And next on our list is two characteristics of fiber types. So there are three classifications, types of skeletal muscle fibers in the human body. You've probably heard these names before. If you haven't, don't worry, I'm gonna go over them. But before I list those three, I'm gonna tell you the criteria on which we base to categorize that. So three types of muscle fibers and the criteria that we use to categorize these are based on speed of contraction, so how fast they are, as well as the mode or mechanism they use to form ATP. I'm gonna write pathways for forming ATP. This one, the speed of contraction, that's dictated by how fast that ATP can be split on the myosin head. So I'm gonna write how fast the myosin head splits the ATP molecule to give it energy. Some fibers do it really quickly, others do it not so quickly. So we base our three types on these two things, speed of contraction and pathways for forming ATP. Now I'm gonna list the three major types, one, two, three. The first type is called fast glycolytic fibers. Just like the name implies, they're very fast at splitting that ATP on the myosin head, so they're quick. They're glycolytic, that means they form their ATP using glycolysis and no aerobic activity, no oxygen. So some, some characteristics of these fibers are they are large in diameter. They're very strong. They produce very forceful contractions. They tend to be white in color because they don't have a lot of myoglobin, almost none. I'm gonna write no myoglobin. Take that with a grain of salt. Very, very low amounts of myoglobin. So that means they don't store, bind and store oxygen and turn red. So they tend to be whitish in color. They also fatigue quickly. So they're the power fibers that are very strong, don't use oxygen, but they, the, the contractions can't last very long. They fatigue quickly. The second type are the opposite. They are slow oxidative fibers. These are not very fast at splitting the ATP molecule on the myosin heads. They use oxygen to produce their ATP. These tend to be small in diameter. They tend to be weaker in force of contraction, but also they do not fatigue quickly. They're, they have long endurance. They tend to be red in color because they have a lot of myoglobin. When myoglobin binds oxygen, it turns red. So they store a lot of oxygen. They have many mitochondria. These have few to no mitochondria. Why? Because mitochondria is where oxygen and an energy source go to produce ATP. So I'm gonna write arrow up on mitochondria. And finally, the third type of muscle fiber are a combination of number one and two. They are fast, oxidative fibers. 
They're sort of middle fibers. They're very fast at splitting the ATP molecule to give myosin energy. They use oxygen. So these tend to be somewhere, I'm gonna put medium size. They do tend to be red in color because they do have myoglobin that stores oxygen. They also have an abundance of mitochondria. They tend to produce, they're sort of the best of both worlds. They produce strong contractions, but they don't, not quite as strong as these, but they don't fatigue very quickly. So they resist fatigue. So that gives you an idea of the three types of muscle fibers. We all have all three types, all of us. Now in what combination we have these three types is genetically based. So everybody's different. We all have all three, but how much of each individual category each person has is determined by our genetics. However, when we, depending on what activity we perform, we can change this type of fiber, fast oxidative, oxidative fiber to become either fast glycolytic or slow oxidative depending on our activity. So let's just say I wanna be a weightlifter. We use this example again really quickly. If I wanna be a weightlifter, I start working out a lot of resistance training, lift weights every day, my fast oxidative fibers will get recruited to become fast glycolytic fibers to help me perform those activities. But let's say I'm tired of that, I wanna quit, I stop that training. The ones that, get, that did get converted revert back to being this type. Now, a month later, I change my mind and I wanna become a marathon runner, which is what these, these are for endurance. I already wrote long endurance. Um, so if I start training for marathons, I can recruit number threes, fast oxidative fibers, to become slow oxidative fibers to assist in that activity. So we, we literally can change our fiber type somewhat temporarily based on the demand that's put on the body. <clears throat> so our muscles are, all of our muscles are basically a mixture of this type, this type, and this type how much of the percentage within one muscle of each type, that's what's genetically determined. <clears throat> okay, just like um, uh, we stated for, for bone growth activity, uh, activity for muscle tissue is vital, not, not just beneficial, but necessary for healthy muscle tone. And one of my last boards, I'm almost finished, Muscle tone refers to the consistent, almost constant state of contraction within the human body. So I'm gonna give you an example. Even subconsciously, we don't even think about this. Many of our muscles stay in a somewhat contracted state. That's how I can sit up right now in my chair and how you're probably sitting up in your chair. We can hold our heads up because of, of constant muscle contraction in the neck and in the back. Likewise, even when we're sleeping, we, we still retain some muscle tone in our muscles. And other types of muscles besides skeletal muscle um, exhibit this. For example, smooth muscle in the walls of our arteries and veins, there's a constant state of semi-contraction that allows our vessels to stay in this somewhat contracted state. Yes, our vessels can dilate when the muscle relaxes and they can constrict when the muscle contracts, but generally they stay in some sort of muscle tone, semi-constricted state, and that helps maintain blood pressure. So the last thing I'm gonna do for today's lecture is talk a little bit about smooth muscle before we end. <clears throat>
I'm going to try to just make a comparison with skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle, remember, no conscious control over this. We find it in our organs and vessels. And first, I'm going to list some similarities of smooth muscles, and then I'll list some differences. Similarities, let's spell correctly here. Similarities to skeletal muscle. Hopefully some of this will make sense. <clears throat> Smooth muscle uses actin and myosin and a sliding filament theory. So it behaves different, but myosin does grab actin and, and move it and pull it. It does it quite differently in a different fashion, but I want you to know that actin and myosin are present. <clears throat> also, calcium is used to ultimately help energize myosin head in skeletal muscle. So that's both a similarity and a difference. In skeletal muscle, calcium is used, just like in smooth muscle, we need calcium is the similarity. The difference is in skeletal muscle, calcium uncovers those active sites on the actin molecule. In smooth muscle, however, the calcium energizes something called, it's, it's a kinase molecule that splits the ATP to energize the myosin head. So without being too complicated, I'm just gonna say calcium energizes a molecule called calmodulin, which is not present in skeletal muscle. And that <clears throat> activates an enzyme, a kinase enzyme which ultimately phosphorylates the myosin head. Another difference in the calcium business, in a skeletal muscle, calcium is completely stored in the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In smooth muscle, the source of calcium mostly, a little, bit of, a little bit of the calcium is stored inside the muscle cell in smooth muscle, but most of it, most calcium, that means the source is from outside of the cell, is extracellular. It's not, most of it is not stored inside of the cell. All right, a few other comparisons. Um, finally, smooth muscle, I'll remind you what we're talking about here. When it contracts, it contracts in a twisting fashion, sort of like wringing out a wet towel. So it produces this spiral-like contraction. <clears throat> also in smooth muscle, it can be either neurally, neural, and or hormonally induced for contraction. So neural and or hormonal stimulation of contraction. Some smooth muscles respond to hormones. That's not the case in skeletal muscle. Finally, smooth muscle, every cell is not innervated by a motor nerve ending, a nerve ending. So just, I'm gonna put a star here. In skeletal muscle, which we're finished talking about, a regular muscle that's attached to bones that we have conscious control over, 
every single cell in that muscle must have a nerve ending that stimulates it in order for it to contract. A big difference in smooth muscle is the cells are arranged in a sheet more like this. And the electrical transmission from a nerve can be transferred from cell to cell. So if I take a nerve and I innervate this cell right here, it can actually transfer the electrical impulse from cell to cell throughout this sheet of muscle. It doesn't have to have its own nerve ending on every single cell. That's a major difference. And also, of course, you know that they're involuntarily controlled. We don't have conscious control over the contractions. All right, guys, we made it through our second um, muscle lecture. I'm going to cut my recording here.